Good morning, church. Good morning, and we are glad that you're starting your week off again, gathered with God's people to sit under God's Word, to sing His praises, to call out to Him, and to encourage one another. And so I want to welcome you. Hope today is an encouragement to you. Uh, If you are a guest with us, we invite you to, uh, so that we can minister to you personally, uh, that you text the number 94,000, and you can text the word Curtis Guest. Uh, there's other things up there that, that we'll get to at the end of the service. But just so that we can get to know who you are, that you are here, and so that we can minister to you and to your family. So we invite you now to worship with the Lord with us in song. Well, good morning. We are glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing together about the victory, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ this morning. Y'all know it, so y'all sing it with me. Come on, let's sing this. I heard, and I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Stop me and rob me with 
with us. Praise the Father. Praise the Father. grab your Bible with me and go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. All right. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. God, just thank you for... uh, this opportunity that we have to gather together to worship you in song. Um, Thank you for um, who you are, your character that's unchanging, that you're faithful to us, um, that you pour out your love on us. Um, Lord, we think upon uh, just the sacrifice that you made, uh, that you would send your son on the cross to die for us. Um, And uh, Lord, as we have just read um, from 1 Thessalonians, Lord, help us um, according to your word to be imitators of you, that the, that the world would see um, our example, Lord, how you've worked in us, how you've changed our lives, um, so that they would see, Lord, that you are a powerful God, a God that redeems. Um, Lord, as we go throughout the rest of our time together um, in worship and in song and through the preaching of your word, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open our hearts, open our eyes to see what your word has to say as we read through First Thessalonians, that we would be impacted and changed because of it. I pray that as we leave as well, Lord, that we would um, go out on mission or wherever we are, wherever you've placed us um, to imitate you, um, to be an example to others so that they would see your glory. And uh, so we just give this time to you and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, James, for reading God's Word and take us to Him in prayer and to those who led us in song. Thank you that you are leading us to worship. Well, I'm amazed at how fast my kids are growing up and developing. And don't worry for the one that's in here, I'm not going to share anything specific about you. But they're learning new information, new skills, how to integrate things constantly. And they're even helping each other to learn something once they learn something themselves. But on the other end of life, we just buried my grandfather on Friday. And he had a number of grandchildren and and children uh, that he taught many things to. And I'm somewhere in the middle. Even though I was confused for my daughter's grandfather recently. I was kind of offended by that. But uh, I look forward to to growing old. But still, the, the human lifespan is a helpful way of looking at the Christian life. It's not a one-to-one comparison, but it is a helpful way of us to frame things, to look at it. See, we have to, just like we're born in our, our physical life, we need to be born again by God. We need his radical action for us to start the Christian life. But we also have to grow to become more like Christ And we help others to become disciples of Jesus and to grow. We reproduce. So this morning as we look at the letter of Paul to the the Thessalonians, his first letter, we're going to see this life cycle of a Christian disciple. Birth, growth, and reproduction. So looking at chapter 1 that James just read for us. We're going to look at birth. So if you're taking notes or you want to follow along on the uh, Uversion app, chapter 1 explains birth. Now, just like when we looked at Ephesians this summer and recently we've been in the letter to the Philippians, when we read most of the letters in the New Testament, we need to remember who, to whom they're addressed. It's not just individuals. It's to groups. It's, so when Paul says you, it's plural. It's y'all. So he opens up with a word, not of condemnation, but of, not try harder, but grace and peace. Now, as we read this, we need to ask the question, not what does it have to do with me? Not just that, but what does it have to do with us? 
See, the earliest Christians understood themselves to be following Jesus. Sure, that is true. But their personal relationship, they did not see that as enough. They, they rightly saw that they were self-consciously connected to a specific group of other Christians, that this is the idea of church membership. It doesn't have the name, but it's the idea. And so this is going to be obvious as we move through this. So keep in mind the audience. Now in verses four and five, Paul highlights what disciples need to be born. They need the gospel word to be spoken. So he encourages the church with how uh, he and the team that he worked with, how they regularly pray for them, verses two and three. And he sees in their lives the evidence of God's power. They spoke the message and then God was at work. He thanks God because he's giving God the credit for the results. He's not going, well, I am kind of a big deal. I'm a good preacher. No, he thanks God. See, they helped Paul and his team helped the Thessalonians to find God and to begin to follow Jesus. Now, that may sound familiar. It sounds kind of like our Curtis core. See, we're not being innovative with that. It's just from the Bible. So Paul and his team, they they spoke this gospel message to the Thessalonians. They said that Jesus was the creator and that he was Lord of all. And he was the judge that everyone will answer to. And though God would have been good and right to punish us for our sin, to punish them, he showed mercy by giving his son Jesus to to live the life that we all should have lived and then to die the death that we deserved. He destroyed death. That's what the New Testament says. He destroyed it by rising from the dead. And it's a preview of what's gonna come for all who look to Jesus. So look in verse five. It said that the message came in power in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. So the apostles made the message public, and then God authenticated it. Without that message going public, there would have been no disciples. There would have been no one to obey Jesus' commands and to become like him. So friend, if you're here today and you're not a Christian or you're watching this, if you're not living by dependence on him, this is the central message of Christianity, and of the Bible. It's what God has done for us, not what we try to do to make a bridge back to God. It's what he has done for us. And we must receive that message, though. We must respond to it by turning from our sin and trusting in him, depending fully on the crucified and the risen Jesus for us. So friend, if, if that does not describe you, I urge you, Right now where you're sitting, you can put your hope in him. Church, unless unless we speak this message, there won't be disciples of Jesus. Our kids, our grandkids, maybe our spouse, our neighbors, our coworkers, they will not become disciples of Jesus without hearing this message. No amount of good deeds we do will make it clear enough. Yes, we do the good deeds, but we have to speak the message. Now, if you want to grow in your ability to do that, because some of us are not, we're not confident in that or we're, we're fearful. Talk to me about serving in Curtis Kids. It's the largest group of people that come together on this facility who are unbelievers and they are ready to listen. And, and Curtis Student Ministry, they're not all saved either. And there's ones who are that are bringing their unsaved friends. Church, the kingdom of heaven may look different because you spoke and God works through it. So we have to have the gospel word spoken, but in verses five to 10, the Thessalonians had to receive it. So look there in verse three, and he points out the the imprint of the spirit in their lives. He doesn't just say, well, I heard about a bunch of decisions down there or I heard that y'all had really high attendance. No, instead, he points to good works, that it's coming from faith and love and perseverance. He says, I know that you're saved, that you're you're chosen by God because of how you responded to the message. Look at verse six. He says, you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord. So there was intense persecution from the world around them, and they started acting like the apostles, who were just acting like Jesus. They were transformed. And then 
they spread the word and became examples to the churches around them or to other people uh, in verses six and seven. So this new, newly born church, they received the message, but they didn't just agree to some facts. Their allegiance changed. And so in, in verses eight to 10, it describes that, how their they got this reputation for how they were changed, not just that they identified with Jesus. Verse nine tells us, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. So these newly born disciples, they're, they found God, now they're following Jesus, and very quickly, they are starting to impact the world around them. And their church was a year old at most, at most, this is what real saving faith looks like. See, we've got to be clear on the good news of Jesus. But we also have to be clear on the life that comes out of that, how it creates new life. See, we can't assume it. We, as much as possible, we want to use God-given biblical language and categories. And, and the, the Christian life that we teach has to flow out of what Jesus has done. Because if we don't, we risk conforming to the world and diluting the message down so that the world's not really confronted with the claims. This happened about a dozen years ago when a man named El Mas Loco, if you know Spanish, that means the craziest one. He was the leader of a drug gang and he got a hold of this really popular Christian book. And he thought, this is what my gang needs because it talked about how men need to be dangerous and they need a battle to fight. And so he started having his gangsters read this and he was spreading the news. And there, I've read the book. There are some shreds of truth to what he's saying. But if a gang of drug traffickers who decapitate policemen, if they don't stumble over your message, you might need to go back to the drawing board and ask, is this really a Christ-centered message? I mean, am I right? Church, if we're going to obey Jesus and we're going to make disciples, not just decisions, but disciples of Jesus, we have to be clear on how disciples are born and how they grow, how they live a new life. That's got to be right here in this pulpit. It's got to be in classrooms. It's got to be in our age-graded ministries, small groups, D&D, &D, GAP, our conversations on the car ride, around the table, even when we discipline our kids. We want to make the gospel clear. So who has God put around you sovereignly? Who has he put around you and your, your circle of influence that needs to hear this message spoken? What plan will you make to let them hear it? So we call them to respond, not by just agreeing to some facts, but, as verse 9 says, to turn to God from idols to serve the true and living God. See, a true disciple experiences transformation. It's slow, but it's true. So we speak this gospel word and people have to receive it. But we're not supposed to just remain spiritual infants being pushed around in a stroller. Disciples have to grow in their faith in him. But next we want to look at how. Does that happen? And where does that happen? So in chapters, let's, we're going to move now to chapters two and three. We move, we got birth. Now let's look at childhood. So Paul lays out what he and his team did to help these new disciples to grow, to serve the true and living God, to become more like Jesus. I'm going to bring out some of the themes that, that emerge from this. So first, suffering for the gospel. That's one of the things that, that's necessary for us to grow. And this, this theme of supper, suffering is peppered throughout this section. So first, Paul highlights the role uh, that suffering took for them to even get the gospel to the Thessalonians. So look at, in verse 2 of chapter 2. He said, We had previously suffered and were treated outrageously in Philippi. There was great opposition. So you may remember back in Acts 16 that they were illegally flogged in Philippi and thrown into jail. And then God miraculously freed them. And then the, the jailer was miraculously converted in his, his household. Well, then after they left in Acts 17, they came here to Thessalonica. And so they had a fruitful ministry there, but it was short 
because some Jews stirred up controversy and Paul and his team had to get out of town quick. And in spite of all this opposition, verse four, Paul says, we speak not to please people, but rather God who examines our hearts. Then in verse six, we didn't seek glory from people, either from you or from others. So as easy as it would have been for them to cave to the pressure of what's going on around them, to water down the message, Paul and his team, they feared the Lord and they spoke what he calls in verses eight and nine, he said it's God's gospel. It's God's message, his good news. And those who speak it are what verse four says, they are entrusted with the gospel. It's like being, the kids that are in here, they've heard me say this a lot. It's like being God's mail carrier, God's messenger. See, the messenger is not free to write the message. The mailman does not sit out in front of your house and write your mail and then stick it in the mailbox. It's his job to faithfully deliver the message. But the suffering wasn't just limited to Paul and to his team. In verses 14 and following, Paul tells, he recalls how the Thessalonian church suffered too when they received the gospel. So look at verse 14. It says, for you, brothers and sisters, you became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, since you have also suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews. So in order to hang on to Jesus and the gospel about him, this church suffered at the hands of the culture around them. That's that's the experience of brothers and sisters around the world still. And the, the heat is turning up just a little bit where we live. But it got so bad that Paul had to leave. He tells him in verse, he reminds him in verses 17 to 20. In verse 18, he talks about Satan's work even in this. That satanic opposition was at play. Because Satan does not want this gospel word to go out. He doesn't want the message to be clear. He doesn't want people to be born into God's kingdom. And Paul and his team, they were deeply concerned about these people. They didn't say, well, they're going to heaven now, so we're good. See, they weren't just after decisions. They were after disciples, people who grew to be like Jesus. So then in three, this is chapter three, verses one to four. He says, therefore, when we could no longer stand it, we thought it was better to be left alone in Athens. And we sent Timothy. And the reason was to strengthen and encourage you concerning your faith so that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. In fact, when we were with you, we told you in advance that we were going to experience affliction. So rather than having Timothy's presence and his comfort and his help, they suffered in a way by sending Timothy away to check on the faith of the Thessalonian church. The gospel moves disciples to suffer for the sake of others. Now they had already taught them this, to expect suffering. In Acts 14, Paul strengthened people, strengthened believers and encouraged them with this, he says it's necessary to, to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. He strengthened them and encouraged them with that truth. See, we have to persevere through our trouble. It's like growing pains that a kid experiences. I remember my legs hurting below my knee as a kid. And an old friend helped me to see the obvious with this and connect the dots. The fact that it's hurting is evidence that you're growing. It's something is happening there. And so when we go through difficulty, God is at work, even though it may hurt. So don't lose heart when you suffer. God is working in you to make you who you should be, to be like Jesus. Well, thankfully, suffering is not the only thing that we need to grow. We also need to be nurtured and taught So in in chapter 2, 7 to 12, Paul brings this up. He uses this tender family picture or number of pictures to describe the the work that they did among them. And so uh, he says in verses 7 and 8, rather than being a burden to them, he said, we became, the word's literally infants among you. As a nurse nurtures her own children, we cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, Well, then look in verse 11. He says, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you to live worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. See, they didn't use their authority to take advantage of this new church. 
They worked hard to show that they weren't selling and peddling the gospel. Now see, he, elsewhere he's clear that in a church that's been established in a place that it's right and good for a church to financially support a pastor or pastors so that they can give themselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. But this church is still very young and there's opponents who think that Paul may, and his team may be swindlers. They didn't have private jets yet, but we have those now. Now this church is, uh, is young and they need this tenderness. And so he, compare, he uses all these family imagery uh, to, to use his authority in a good way to help them along towards godliness. And it's his, in his essence, he's saying, receive God's love and then keep repenting of your sin. Keep turning away from your sin to turn to God from the idols and serve the living God. Keep on, keep on. This sounds like following Jesus and investing in others. This is what the pastors were called to do, but it wasn't just the pastors who were due to this. And we'll see this in a minute. Pastors are not called to be celebrities or CEOs or stand-up comedians. We are to care for Jesus' sheep. So church, when you pray for your pastors, pray that we would joyfully nurture and teach you to prepare you to suffer and to be willing to suffer for your good. This is what we need and this is what the church needs. Well then, verse 13, Paul picks up something else that disciples need to grow. He reminds them of the key tool that God uses in their life to make them grow. And it's not impressive kids or youth or seniors programs. It's not guitars. It's not organs. It's not smoke and lasers or nice facilities or trendy aesthetics or even having the right elected pagan in in place. Look at verse 13. He says, this is why we constantly thank God. Because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is, the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. So the Spirit breathes out the word. And then teachers, pastors, and others, they speak that word. And then the Spirit uses it to cause us to grow, to be like Jesus. So friend, how much word and truth are you taking in? If we just listen to a sermon and then we go on out, we never think about it more, we never talk about it more with anyone, and then we're discipled by hours and hours of media, social media or entertainment, and we talk about that with others and how funny this was or how well, this is going on, it's like taking a nice, a good healthy meal with some broccoli and then going and eating bowls and bowls of candy with rat poison sprinkled in. It kind of undermines the healthy meal. The broccoli and the other nutrients just aren't as effective when you have all the rest. So how, could you, how, what could you do to get more word, more truth in, to shape your conscience, to shape your desires? Well, lastly, in this section, Paul highlights the role of personal ministry. So in chapter 3, he talks about how his team went just beyond the, the public teaching. They longed to be present with them. Because remember, they had to leave. And so they sent Timothy to go check in on them. He didn't just send a letter. He sent a letter, but he also sent Timothy. And in verse 6, he says of the Thessalonians, he said that you long to see us as we long to see you. In verse 10, he says, we pray very earnestly night and day to see you face to face and to complete what is lacking in your faith. It, they need to be present to know this. So church, giving and receiving personal face-to-face -face ministry is essential for growing to be like Jesus. I urge you to, to look for and to pray for and try to find ways to engage and to be engaged personally. And that's even if you're at home because you are not comfortable still gathering in large groups due to health. I don't want to burden your conscience if that is a concern. But if it's simply a matter of inconvenience, then you need to hear this. The live stream and the broadcast, they're not meant to serve those, who, they, they are meant to serve those who cannot gather. They are not simply to make following Jesus a little more convenient. 
following him is not always convenient. He, he is Lord. He gets to reorganize our, prior, our priorities, our schedules, our lives, because he is Lord. So disciples grow to be like Jesus in the context of the web of relationships of God's people in the local church, not on our own. And so pastors and others, we nurture and teach and help others to endure suffering because it's coming. If you're a Christian or you're not, suffering is coming. But we aren't simply concerned with our own growth. So let's move to chapter four and five and look at this last stage of reproduction. See, growing disciples, they reproduce. So the key question is, is how? How do they do this? The growth, our growth in Christ, our relationship with the, God, with the Lord, it is deeply personal, but it is never private. It is never kept to ourselves. By its very nature, it is looking out to help others grow. And so this is where we talk about following Jesus and investing in others. And there's impacting the world. See, it's, all, it's not that this goes in a clear line. They're all mingled together. So Paul starts off this section and he's giving us these moral commands of, of how we live. Now, the concern is living in a way that's consistent with Jesus. It's pleasing God. This should be our aim. And so this is what he says in verse one. Additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you received instruction from us on how you should live and please God, as you are doing, do this even more. So look to please God. Now, do you want to know God's will for you? God's calling he says it right here. Look in verse three. For this is God's will, your sanctification, your holiness, that you keep away from sexual immorality. The word is porneia. It might sound familiar. Verse four, control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. So this forbids sexual relations outside of the safe covenant between a husband and a wife. That relationship is pure and holy, but all others are not. Verse six, he gets serious. He says, God is the avenger in this kind of sin. See, God cares deeply what we do with our bodies, not just our souls. And he's got the right to tell us what to do with the bodies. He gave them to us. Friend, God cares more about the sexual purity of your heart and your body than about your college major or where you work. Doesn't mean he doesn't care about the other, but your character is of more concern. Students, those of you getting ready to go to college, give, give your attention to who you are becoming, not trying to do this and go, where's the spirit blowing me to what, what dorm room do I need to be in? What kind of person are you becoming? So rather than immorality, Paul says our lives are to be marked by holy love in verses 9 to 12. We're to increase in love, 11 and 12 says. So here he says to, we're supposed to seek to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, so that you may behave properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. So a key way that you can love others is to do your job well. Whether that's at home or whether that's you go and you get a paycheck, whatever it is, it's at school, do your job well. It's a testimony to the goodness of God and the goodness of the gospel and the life that it creates in us. Your work is not the ultimate meeting in your life and it's not just a necessary evil. It's a good thing and a way to love others. So do your work well. Well, next, Paul turns to tell how we should encourage one another with Christ's return. We're to use our words to build others up with the truth of Christ's return. So look in chapter four, verse 13. So apparently, after Paul left, there, people died in the church and they had questions because they were such a young church. And they're concerned that they're missing out on God's kingdom. And so they needed comfort. 
So Paul explains that Jesus will return bodily. He's going to rescue his people, and he's going to uh, those who have already died. He's also going to come for them. And the dead in Christ will actually rise first, it tells us in verse 16. Now, in verse 17 and 18, it says, And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. See, our hope is not just heaven. It's not just a pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. It is that we will be with the Lord himself, with his people. And then he repeats it again in 5 verse 10. We're going to be with the Lord. That's what makes heaven good. Now he adds a note too about the timing or how the Lord is going to return. He says in verse 2 of of chapter 5 that he's going to return like a thief in the night. But they, they shouldn't be surprised. His point is not to predict a date. That's not what he's saying. His point is live ready. Look at verse six. Let us stay awake and be self-controlled. And then verse eight. Since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. I mean, this is aggressive. This takes effort. This is not coasting. The reason to live this way, he says, is because of your identity as God's people and your future. It's be who you are. You are God's people. You're not part of the darkness anymore. And he says in verse 9 that God has appointed us for salvation, not for wrath. His people will not be punished. We will be with him. And then in verse 11, it sounds like what he just said at the end of chapter 4. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. It's not enough for them to hear Paul say it. He says, then you say it to each other. So in light of Jesus' return, he's going to judge his enemies, but he's also going to save his people. Live ready. And part of the way that we live ready is that we use our words to help the people around us to live ready. People in our local church, not just our friends. We don't use our words to complain or to gossip or to tear down or to focus on trivia. We come alongside them with our words. We encourage them and comfort them. We push them along. We exhort them and we urge them to live ready because Jesus is coming back. So maybe someone around you is going through a tough time. Take the initiative to go to them and encourage them with your words, maybe with a hug. But don't just say, it's going to be okay. It'll all work out. You don't know that. It may not work out in this life. It may not. We are not promised that. Don't just point them to some vague sense of, of goodness. Point them to the Lord himself who is coming back for them. They need him. He's coming back to make creation right again. We are going to be with him and they are going to be who God made them to be. He has promised and he keeps his promises. Point them to Jesus' return. Kids, you, you can do this too. You can do this with your siblings. You can do this with your parents, with your friends. See, our, our final hope is not ultimately in that we get a better job. Or that we've had a series of breakups and we're going to finally meet that spouse. Or that our death is going to get postponed. Or we're going to get better grades. Our hope is finally in resurrection life with the Lord. And God intends for that hope to press into us through the ministry of the people around us. Our brothers and sisters in the local church. Well, in this, this last section that Paul gives us in verse 12, he talks about how the word echoes. It echoes through the church. So look in verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. So you gotta remember, this is a young church And so Paul is either teaching them that they need to respect their pastors and to follow them and not be so dependent on him, or um, he's telling them to recognize people who, even though they don't have pastors yet because he left so quickly, 
that they look at the people who are doing pastoral work and recognize them as these are the pastors. So a pastor that you see, because remember, he's, don't depend on me so much. A pastor that you see who knows you is better than a YouTube or a podcast preacher any day. Now, did you notice what the, pastor, the pastoral work looked like there? It involves hard work among the people. It involves leadership or oversight in the Lord. And it's tied to admonishing, warning, instructing the people. So the work of the pastors, the elders, the New Testament often calls them, is tied to the word. It's not administrating religious programs or experiences for people to consume. It's word work. But it doesn't just stop with the pastors. We've already seen that, but now he makes it really clear. So look at 14 and 15. He says, and we exhort y'all, brothers and sisters. Now, your translation may not have the same word, but it's the same thing he said that the pastors do. The the warning, the admonishing. Y'all do that. Those who are idle, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. So who is doing the word work? Well, it's the pastors, but it's the church. All of y'all do the word work. Pastors model and we lead in this, but all are using our mouths. Or even if we are hearing impaired and we do ASL, we can use our words to encourage God's people. Now, a writer named Jonathan Lehman gives us a good image of, of what this looks like. That God's word, it reverberates through the church. It echoes out from the pulpit in the classrooms into the conversations in the hall and out into the parking lot and around tables and on the phone and at the bedside. God's word is working its way out into our lives. So I ask you, with whom can you talk about what God is teaching you? Who can you ask, what is God teaching you? Who can you ask, what are you wrestling with? How can I pray for you? How how can I help you put into practice what you are learning? These kinds of questions. Think about that. Who is God? There's a lot of people in this room. Who, Who around you can you use your words to help God's words echo into their lives? So friend, if if you're not serving believers around you, then you're stunting your own growth as a disciple of Jesus. There are ways that God intends for you to become like Jesus that you are not because you are missing out on that. And you are partially stunting the growth of other people that need your spiritual gifts, your your echoing word in their life. But, But assuming that you are serving people around you in some way, regardless of your role, you can do word work. You don't have to be a teacher You can greet people and ask, hey, how can I pray for you? And just pray for them right on the spot with some biblical concern. Maybe you work in the nursery. You can, we have posters on the wall, big, bold, biblical prayers to pray for the children and for their parents. And it's just the Bible, pray pray these things. God cares about these things. If you're a deacon or you're doing caring hearts ministry or touch of love, give God's words of biblical encouragement to them, to widows, to shut-ins, whoever you're ministering to. If you're stacking chairs, you can be talking with the people around you, not just about the weather and sports, but about what God is doing in your life. When you leave the room this morning, you can talk to the people about what you just heard. Hey, can you pray that I would do that? God time doesn't just stop when we say the service is dismissed. You can sing audibly and joyfully to reinforce the truth that we are taking in. And when when you pick up your kids, don't just say, well, did you have fun today? We want to set the bar higher than just did you have fun. Ask them, what truth did you guys talk about today? You can ask, did they enjoy it? We want them to enjoy it. But if they say, I don't know, I forgot, that happens a lot I know, we send the stuff home. We email it to you so that that doesn't have to stop the conversation. So you'll know this is what you talked about. And then you can keep that conversation going. Brothers and sisters, as vital as 
personal and corporate Bible intake is and as is prayer is, Part of our own growth and the growth of everybody else around us happens when we do word work with each other. As we point one another to scripture, we're pointing ultimately to God who gave us the word. The spirit speaks as we engage with scripture and he meets us there. So we have to ask, are we individually, are we as families, are we as a church being formed more by what God says or by the culture around us? See, do, or do we know what God says to be able to let it shape us? It is up to us individually to pay attention to Scripture. But it's also up to our Christian family to engage us with it. And then vice versa. It's up for them to, uh, for us to engage them. And that's not just my overzealous opinion and getting all worked up. That's what the Holy Spirit says right there through Paul. Like we cannot afford to neglect this gift of grace that God intends for his people to bless one another with. We are, we are taking the valve and just closing it off. Now as we close up this letter of Paul, we're going to be closing the sermon. I, there's a joke that a, a father was asked by his son. He goes, Dad, what does the preacher mean when he says in conclusion? And the dad said, absolutely nothing. This does mean something. We are, we are closing up here. But I want you to look at verses 23 and 28 and how Paul sandwiches these moral commands inside uh, prayer. So before and after he gives them these do these things, these be aggressive, give effort, do this, help others grow, he prays. So in chapter 3, 11 to 13, he prays. And then in 5, 23 to 25, he prays. And he asks God for the same thing. He asks God to make the church blameless and holy for when Jesus comes. Same thing. So God, please work. Hey, y'all, this is what you do to grow. God, please make it happen in their life. And then look at verse 24. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. It's a promise. But he doesn't just zap us as we sit on the couch or sit on the pew. God does make us holy and blameless. He causes our growth as disciples of Jesus. But he does it through the ministry of other disciples. In part, not, not completely, but in part, through their words. Their echoing word work. Well, then Paul charges them to greet all the brothers and sisters. The whole church. And to have affection, that's what he's talking about with a holy kiss. It's a cultural thing. And to have the letter read to all the brothers and sisters in verse 27. They were a group, so they, they knew who one another were. They were a defined group. It's Again, it's the concept of church membership without the name. And so the Holy Spirit, through Paul, is calling for the whole church to pay attention to the whole church. Not just their friends, but the whole thing. So church, we should thank God for the word work that he has done at this church for almost 150 years. We're not quite there, but he's done that work in and through his people here. He's caused disciples to be born into God's kingdom and to grow and to reproduce. But if we're honest, we've also got to look and recognize there is a lot more work that needs to be done so that disciples will continue to be born and so that they will continue to grow and so that they will continue to reproduce and help others grow. There's a lot more work to be done so that the whole church pays attention to the whole church and to the whole church's growth. So hold that together. That, that I'm exhorting you. I'm encouraging you and urging you on in that. Hold that together with what Paul says in verse 28. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Even as we have much more to do ourselves, and even as we have a lot more to help one another do, God's final word to this church and to our church is not law. It's not do. His last word is done. It's grace for us. We have the resting place of what Jesus has done for us and in us. And so from that resting place, then we have the power to go and do 
It's not ultimately up to us, though we have to, we have to give effort, but God is at work in us. And so we are helping those other people around us to grow into his image. That causes our own growth. So church, we have heard from the Lord. Now let's respond back to him. Let's take this truth back to him in prayer and we'll have a time of response. Lord, we praise you for your work in each of us. We praise you for your work in this church. Lord, for so long the gospel has been spoken and it has been received and we thank you. Lord, people have become disciples and they've grown and they have helped other people to become disciples and to grow. And Lord, we want to see that continue. We wanna see that in our children and our grandchildren to the generations that are not yet born and to people outside this church who are still in darkness, who don't know Jesus. Lord, we pray that our church and other churches in this area would be faithful to this. God, give us joy as we believe what you say, as we obey what you say, as we give effort and work out of the resting place of Jesus and his grace. Lord, do your work in us now and in this week. Let the word echo out from us. Lord, I pray that we would have humble hearts that you would expose what needs to be exposed. If we need to be comforted, oh God, would you comfort your people? If we need to be moved to repentance and to obedience, Lord, would you do that? Just give us humility before you. And I pray that your church would reflect your glory. Lord, help us to grow and to help others to do so. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.